Good evening and welcome to our lecture organized by Alternative Policy Solutions here at AUC. And thank you for being with us. My name is Farida Ma'ar and I'll be moderating this session. With the emergence of critical pedagogy as a school of thought in the 1980s, thanks to the contributions of scholars, thinkers, and practitioners, such as Paolo Freire, Henry Giroux, and Michael Apple, among others, a renewed emphasis was placed on social justice in and through education. Critical pedagogy essentially sought to link practices of schooling to transformative action in the interest of the oppressed and marginalized communities. But where are we today since the emergence of critical pedagogy? How can we aspire for a more socially just and communal world? It is within this context that I am thrilled to introduce Professor Carlos Alberto Torres, who will be speaking to us about education, social justice, and global citizenship. Professor Torres is Distinguished Professor, UNESCO Chair in Global Learning and Global Citizenship Education at the University of California, Los Angeles. He is also the Rector of the Paulo Freire Institute at the Graduate School of Education, and he served as director of the UCLA Latin American Center. Professor Torres holds a PhD from Stanford and across his rich career has authored over 40 books, including one which has been of immense help to my work personally, social theory and education. Without further ado, please join me in welcoming Professor Torres. Thank you very much. Good afternoon to all of you. Thank you for being here. I am delighted for the invitation by the American University of Cairo. I am also very happy to be celebrating 100 years of uh, scholarly life in Egypt. And it is also the 100 year of scholarly life of my own university. UCLA is also celebrating 100 years. And some of you know that's a very powerful, it's a powerhouse. But it started with very humble origins as a normal call in Los Angeles. And I presume that once you see history, you realize that only good things make sense to speak about and the history of these two universities intertwined as they are, are important to justify what we try to do today in this room about these concepts that are so important for the whole world. The question that I'd like to discuss with you today is the connection between social justice, education, and global citizenship. So I prepared a paper which I don't plan to read, but I have sentences that I prefer to read because it will be easier to continue with the slides. Um, we stand on the precipice of a global planetary cliff. Two options laid out before humanity. On the one side is the continued expansion of democracy the further extension of human rights and freedoms, and concerted efforts to address the growing threats and reality of global climate change. On the other, the dismantling of democracy in lieu of populist authoritarian rule, increased attacks on the marginalized, oppressed, and exploited population of the globe, and acceleration of the degradation of planet Earth toward its imminent doom. The future laid out as a battle between two dominant discourses, one that seeks to recapture the heart and imagination of the Enlightenment with the proper deconstruction of the problems of the Enlightenment, and the power of scientific research and rationality on the road to a brighter future for a great mass of people. The other an atavistic return to a past where a small global elite dominated the political, economic, and cultural worlds, where propaganda, chaos, 
and ideology govern the public sphere and where multinational corporations and the power elite dictate policy at the local, national, and global levels. In this discussion, the role of education is particularly relevant. So let me offer you a brief synthesis of the global trends as I see them. The first one is the loss of faith in the neoliberal economics. The neoliberal discourse actually started around the 1980s in a very interesting conflation of neoliberalism and neoconservatism. And it has captured the imagination of economists. One of the peculiarities of economics is that it's a science that is constrained by hegemonies. And usually, whoever controls the science at a particular period of time is the one that speaks about economics. In other terms, when the Keynesians or neo keynesians control the economy, everything was about uh, public investment, etc. When the monetary is controlled, well, everything was about control of the monetary ways. The neoliberals created a number of premises, but one of the most important that dovetailed very nicely with the model of globalization was breaking down the barriers between the different markets and facilitating the internationalization of trade. The second element that is very clear in many parts of the world, certainly I live in, in the US, is the breakdown of the white male dominated social and cultural lifestyles. This is an element that you will notice also in Western Europe particularly. This in itself is one of the explanations why we have the Trump regime in the US. The third one is the collapse of the normal political process. Uh, the normal political process requires checks and balances. If you look at what is happening in some part of Eastern and Western Europe, what is happening in the US, we notice that the checks and balances are being dismantled, or there is an attempt to dismantle from the perspective of Trumpism. This is not the way political debates occur in previous democratic experiences. So let me offer you some comments about the question of the end of the normal. There's a book that came out some time ago, maybe three or four years ago, by James Galbraith. And this book is important because it speaks about the end of the normal. And Galbraith is a kind of a neo keynesian who is very critical of neoliberal traditions. But essentially what he's saying is that four things have changed. And these things that have changed will show that the previous past in economics is not coming back. His argument is by decades. He sees the, the world and the economics until 1970 to be progressive in such a way that distribute resources more widely, more efficacious, and essentially in more democratic ways. After 1970s, things began to change. The 80s and the 90s shows the impact of neoliberalism. And then we reach then 2008 with this extraordinary crisis. He says that we are not going to go back for four reasons. The first one, the rising cost of real resources. If one looks, for instance, to petroleum, that's not true because oil has lower, lower its price, but because of the abundance of oil. Fracking has made such a difference that the US, who was always a producer, but mostly a consumer of oil from the Middle East, now is an exporter of oil. So when you look at key elements of the process of quote unquote growth, because some people will argue that we need to degrowth, you will notice that these elementary resources, these primary resources are now being more expensive in other areas. The second element 
is forget about empire. We have seen you in Egypt have experimented colonialism in your blood, in your flesh. Empires of the 18th, 19th century are not going to come back unless China emerged as the 21st century empire. And China has interest in being an empire. But nevertheless, the question is the futility of war. Wars were always fought either in open spaces or like in the First and Second World War in areas close to cities. In the Middle East, you can see the whole argument against ISIS. It was an area in which ISIS controlled territory. And there were many ways in which it was confronted by foreign powers. But essentially, imagine what will be if really ISIS controlled Cairo. How would you get rid of an enemy inside a city. You have two choices. One is catastrophic, and that is an atomic bomb. The technology of war has gotten to a point that war as a solution is not any longer viable. Now, the third element is that if you really, let me go back to, to oil and petroleum. If you really look at the change in the world, it have to be 1973-74, in which the oil cartel forced all the other countries, the powerful countries on earth, try to figure out how to lower the cost when the, the cartel has created a way to control the most important product in the world economy. And what happened next? The digital revolution. And the digital revolution created a new condition that were always existing before, but this time exacerbated. The replacement of human labor by technology, digital cultures, machines, and robots. One robot in a line of production displaces six workers of the highest qualification. This is the future, a jobless society. The first, the first thing I want to say, I am of the opinion that if you replace labor with robots, robots should pay the taxes that labor used to pay. And I'm not kidding. Because there will be so much unemployment that you have to figure out how you make people's life dignifying and the resources have to come from somewhere. And the fourth element, and it's a critical element in capitalism, the breakdown of law and ethics in the financial sector. We all know that capitalism is fraught with contradictions, but the contradiction today is how the financial sector can destroy the whole system. And the whole argument in 2008, 2009 is how did it happen? Why in the US a big crisis in the housing system was transported all over the world and affected all our economies? How did it happen? Well, very simply, because moral hazard. And the moral hazard was predicated on the actions of financial capitalism that acted temerarily without any concerns whatsoever of the implication of the way in which they were investing, they were selling, short selling, etc. So these four elements by Galbraith is an important element to consider. Um, seriously. He also concludes two other elements. One is that growth will never reach the height that we had before. Remember, China was growing at 12% about six years ago. Now it's about 6%. And the US is about 2% now. And that's probably what is going to stay forever or less. Latin America now is growing at 0.4%. 
we are now in this decade that we are entering exactly at the same level in Latin America that we were in the 1980s with was only one country in the, in the whole region that did not degrowth and was Colombia because Colombia was producing the only international product that everybody seems to want to buy. I'm not kidding. Look at the statistics. The last one is the east-west convergence and divergence. I don't think I'm the prophet of dumb if I tell you that the last 40 years of history seems to be finishing in front of our own eyes. In the US, you have a guy who have trademarked the following statement, make America great again. Make America great was a statement that Reagan did in his early ages, but Trump said, no, no, but make America great again. I did it and I trademarked, so it's mine. You know what? Xi Jinping is doing in China, let's make China great again. So you have two extraordinary countries. The first, the richest market on earth, 23 trillion, the US. The second richest market on eight, 13 trillion economy, China. That surpassed Japan in the last decade. So, here we have an extraordinary conflict between two colossus. And this conflict is not only about trade. If we think that the conflict is about trade, we will be simplifying a very complex situation. The conflict is about power in the world system. And this conflict could reach severe consequences because at least in the Cold War, there was the detente, was the idea of the no first strike. And the no first strike was a reassurance that we will not be destroyed by a mistake by a human or a mistake by a machine. There was a conversation between East and West. There was a conversation between the Soviet Union and the US. Look at all the instances we were very close, 1974, in which Nixon had to make a decision. And the decision was either to drop an atomic bomb on China or begin negotiations for trade. And he was convinced to go in a peaceful way. And you have 40 years of extraordinary trade that allow China to become what China is, or is today, the industrial power of the world. But the other thing that is happening is that since 1989, the end of the uh, Soviet power, the fall of the Berlin walls, what we have now, another wall erected. This wall is not the wall that Trump wants to create around Mexico and the US, which already is not doing the job. It's a digital electronic wall because China has become a powerhouse, particularly in digital culture. And the whole conversation about the G5 is a conversation of who, either the US or China, will reach in this race towards speed and control and win. So we are having now another war, a digital war, a hot digital war. And this has implications that I don't know what we will find out in the next 10 years. So let me offer you a very simple, very simple description of where we are in the world today. This is my graphic, I'm very proud. I'm working with PowerPoint and I'm learning myself, I'm very proud. But if any one of you have studied the dialectics, 
When people explain to you dialectics, which is a model of understanding reality, they tell you there is a thesis, there is an antithesis, and there is a synthesis. So the historical process continued evolving in which things of the past are criticized, some are preserved, they are favored, and then a new model emerged. Let me offer you the three models that you have in front of you, which are class alliances of sort. Back in 1992, um, Michael Apple uh, wrote in his book, Cultural Politics and Education, and his other book about knowledge, that there was a new conservative restoration class alliance. And he defined this class alliance as four groups. Let me quote him. There are four major elements within this alliance. Each has its own relative autonomy history and dynamics. But each also has been secured into the more general conservative movement. These elements include neoliberals, neoconservatives, authoritarian populists, and a particular fraction of the outwardly mobile new middle class. He was absolutely right. And that dominated the 70s, 80s, 90s, and will reach probably the first decade of this century. So the affirmation will be that project, a very complex, convoluted project, but a project that put forward a model of growth and a model of political control. Now, in the middle of the second decade of this century, the class alliance fraction, there was a negation, because also another way to define dialectics is the question of affirmation, negation, negation of the negation. The negation is that the breakdown and the rise of the new populism. The new populism has many terms and we don't have the time to discuss them here. We can do in the question and answer period. But what we have now is a bunch of people all over the world predicating models which are ethnocentric, who are based on racial hate, who are fundamentally putting a finger against immigrants and who saw division among the different societies and also facilitate the rise of new models of fascism. In one other paper, I wrote something that even I was shocked to write. A new model of cosmopolitanism is particular segment of fascism. Fascism is not any longer circumscribed into one nation. It's now circulating worldwide. There are people meeting worldwide and interacting among themselves with a very clear fascist ideology, or at least a white supremacy ideology that turned into all traditional fascism. Now, this really implied and I'm using the US as a good example because I know it very well. Unfortunately, I live in California, so we suffer this experience from the rest of the country, but we don't have much of these people in California. But you have an alliance of the precariat. Have you heard the term before? Precariat? Precariat comes from German, and it's a combination of precariousness and proletariat. Is that proletariat that we call, we used to call a hundred years ago lumpen proletariat, and now it's called precariat. People who don't have jobs that allow them to solve the minimum needs and continue working and feeling good about themselves. The precariat is also about the end of hope. So we should consider that a great deal of the people in the alliance of Trump, people that have given up hope on the new modernity, and for very good reasons. The second, the rural areas. 
the rural areas in the U.S. are in trouble because I live in a rural area in California, but California it doesn't seem to be the U.S. We produce the produce of the whole country. We even produce things that we shouldn't be producing, like avocados that consume tons of water. California doesn't have water. But California is very rich in many different ways. If it will be a, a country alone, we'll rank fifth in the GNP globally in the world. So California is an, is an exception because it's also a coastal place. The big conflict in the US is between the inner land and the coastal areas. The coastal areas are democratic or, the, or they are close to democratic uh, engagement and they are rich and they are particularly, thank you very much, and they are particularly uh, liberal, while the inner parts are not. Then you have the white evangelicals, which are decreasing in numbers, but they are solid voting block. And finally, you have two other characters that nobody understands why they are in the same coalition, but they are there. The plutocrats, the big plutocrats that support financially the Republican Party. We're talking about big money, big, big money. The Democratic Party have their own plutocrats too. And then the working class, they voted with Obama and reversed the vote in 2016 for Trump. So this is the one that I will call the new populism in the US. And then you have <coughs> the, pardon me, the emerging situation of the criticism to this new populism that is emerging. And here you have the role of the unions, decadent as they are in the US, is still important. Then you have color working class, Latinos, Latinas, Afro-Americans, etc. Then you have the middle class in the suburbs, particularly women, who have been consistently opposed to Trump. Even women have voted, that have voted consistently in their life, Republicans, they are now becoming independent or voting for, for the Democrats. And finally, you have the non-white evangelicals. <clears throat> so, this is the situation now. We have moved over the last 40 years into this sequence, and we'll talk more about that in a second. Look at the social mobilization against populism, authoritarianism, and fragile democracies. Let me mention Iran. You know the story better than me at the moment. Hong Kong, everybody knows about Hong Kong today. Poland, Hungary, Turkey, Istanbul is a good symbol of all of this. Moscow, Russia, developing this model of illiberal democracy. Pakistan, Indonesia, Saudi Arabia, Lebanon, Bolivia, Chile, Venezuela, France, this, what happened after a, a year of the celebration of the, of the yellow vest. Mexico is a question mark because it's not growing. Zimbabwe, Ecuador, Brazil, USA. It's a moment in which two elements that are happening in front of our eyes are putting together and consistently been criticized. Low growth and corruption. This is part of this last circle that I mentioned. And depending on how it acts, whether it is subversive or not. But let me give you one example that is quite intriguing to me. Do you know where truly neoliberalism as an economic model was applied for the first time, not what it was predicated by Thatcher or Moroni of Reagan. What it was applied was in Chile, post-1973. And that authoritarianism, that dictatorship, did a constitution that has regulated Chile until now. If you have been following the, the newspapers, there is an incredible revolt against the current government, and this revolt is asking for what? A new constitution. So it's an interesting 
historical and political experience. Okay. <clears throat> These two sentences, I think, synthesize the world as we live it today. We live between the disenchantment with democracy and the discontent with governments, with political systems in many parts of the world fragmented and polarized. So it is in this context that I want to speak for a few minutes, I have about 16 minutes left, on the question of democracy and education. Invariably, people in education are perpetual optimists. In part, because we have actually been convinced over the years from the idea of progressive education all over the world until now, that education is simultaneously the key to growth and development and modernization, and also the key to conflict resolution. And in many different ways, is a precondition, but it's not a sufficient condition for both elements. However, we create constructs all the time. Here I offer you two different constructs. One is called transformative social justice learning. And I emphasize in here the work that happens outside the walls of schools that happen in the internet, that happen in non-formal education, that happen in spontaneous learning, that happens in social movements, that happens in teachers' unions, in other unions, etc. There is a great deal of transformative social justice learning occurring all over the world as we speak. And then you have another social construct, social justice education. Somebody could ask the question, wait a second, justice, social justice, why we need the two terms? Justice itself should be sufficient. Not true. Because justice is blind. And the idea of putting the idea of social justice together is to put a model of social transformation which requires essentially that we attack the sources of inequality. But the problem with liberalism is that we start with the premise that we are all equal. It's a good premise, I like it. However, when you look at endowments, two things are very clear. One, talents are unequally distributed. Some people in this room have talents that absolutely I have, not, I have never had, I will never have. It's not only natural, it's also learning. And then secondly, that there are endowments that set apart the 1%, remember in the US, the movement about the 99%, the 1% versus the rest. So we are now facing two constructs to reconstruct democracy. Let me say a few words about democracy and move on. Number one, people when they are born are not naturally prepared to act democratically. I remember I got a, a rabbit, a small rabbit, from my son who was two years old. A white rabbit with red eyes, beautiful. And I took it with me and said, I'm gonna give it to my son. He's two years old, he will love this rabbit. I put the rabbit on the ground, my son looked at the rabbit, kicked the rabbit so hard that the rabbit went against a wall, bounced back, and ran out of the house, never saw it again. Obviously, my son was not prepared to have a rabbit. He had to be educated. We are all need to be educated into democratic models. That's a reason we need education to create a sensible model of democracy. Not only that, we also need to understand that citizenship is about diversity. It's about diversity of cultures. It's about diversity of religions. It's about diversity of ethnicities, languages. It's about diversity of talents. It's about diversity of opinions. It's about diversity. 
the DNA of today's civilization is diversity. And therefore, the only way you can have serious democratic engagement is respecting diversity and crossing the lines of difference. That doesn't come along very easily. And that's the reason we need democratic classrooms where you exercise democracy. The school is a place in which if authoritarianism is pushed out, could be the beginning of serious democratic practices. That was one of the principles of the reformers in the 1920s that you were studying. That's a central element of Freire when he was criticizing banking education. So the school has a role to play, but we have a problem among many. And I'm not going to begin to talk that we don't have money, we, because we don't have money. But we have another problem. And I think what we are facing now is a situation in which, for reasons that need to be explained fully, we have discontinued, we have betrayed the principles of teaching civic education. Civic education is not any longer a central component of our curriculum. And that's the reason that global citizenship education could come back to us, bringing back a new model of civic education for the global system. <clears throat> I'm involved now in a new research project that is called Understanding Teacher Praxis for Sustaining the Public Good. Teacher Praxis for Sustaining the Public Good. In that sentence, is the equivalent to what we need for democracy to operate first in our classrooms and outside in our public policy. So we want to do a cross-national study of teacher building. Remember the German term so important for education. And global citizenship education in an age of extremes. Because believe me, we live in age of extremes. And this extremist cut across most, if not all, the political spectrum. And if this conflict of extremes is the one that worries me very much, and worries me when it happens particularly in the classroom. So, I have designed a meta-theory of the global commons. What is this meta-theory of the global commons? What I'm talking about when I said global commons? There are three principles. The first principle is that this planet is our only house. We have to protect it against predatory cultures. We have to make it sure that resources survive over time because we have to hunt over this planet in better conditions to our children, to our grandchildren, to our grand-grandchildren. I know that everyone in this auditorium that I meet have grandchildren realize that what I'm saying is absolutely crucial. The second principle, peace is a treasure of humanity. What I mean by that, I already spoke about the catastrophic failure of civilizations if we go into an atomic war. The technology of war today prevents us to, to have war. So, the only way that we can prevent a war is to obtain a perpetual peace of which Kant, who by the way was a racist, spoke so eloquently. And this perpetual peace needs some conditions. And one of them is, curious enough, an argument that Kant made against Hegel and was the argument of the responsibility of hospitality the right of hospitality, that situation that created now 
ways to try to prevent the immigrants that have to live are not demonized. You know, I'm doing work now for UNESCO. I'm writing a, a document for the Latin American uh, uh, governments per UNESCO request. UNESCO is very smart. He's not asking me to write a piece on immigration and something else. The word immigration now is a dirty word for these neo-populists, these Nazi fascists who are considering the immigrant an enemy. They call it populations who are in condition of mobility. What a brilliant term. Populations in condition of mobility. What Kant will say today, they have the right of hospitality. And the US has now one of the worst possible records in any government in the history of the US in the last century with the way in which we are treating exiles, we are treating people who try to move to the US to obtain better conditions. So the third one of these principles is something that will probably resonate with all of you. The idea that people have the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That extraordinary sentence in the US Constitution, not by chance, the US Constitution become a model of many constitutions in the world. Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, in that order. When you look at life, you are looking at the whole model, the liberal model of global citizenship, which is based in the question of human rights, the dignity of the human person. When you look at liberty, you look at one of the most transcendent elements of liberalism, A, to confront the authoritarian, unfettered, unchecked power of the kings, and B, to produce a model in which people will be free to find ways to survive and to prosper, and eliminating the tension which is central in the Western political philosophy between need and freedom. If you really think very carefully of this tension, freedom versus need, need versus freedom, then you have the two potential models of capital accumulation and political democracy. Open up some elements of freedom, constraining freedom to solve the problem of need or the opposite. So, in that context, the idea of happiness becomes quintessential. Tell me if it's not true. All of you want to be happy. When you are absolutely depressed, when you feel completely unhappy, when nothing works for you, when your heart is in pain, what you have is a desire for thanatos, for death because what you are lacking is love. From Freud onwards, the tension between Thanatos and Eros define the principles of our life. And in the concept of this tension, Thanatos and Eros, we seek continuously happiness. And when I make this argument, I ask myself, is this a scientific argument? So I went to the internet and began to look at the possibility that somebody had the same argument before me and created a journal. Going to the internet, you will find many journals talking about happiness. In my own computer, every time I speak about that and people challenge me, I can offer them the description of an article written by two of the most prominent economists of our time that is called The Economic Returns of Happiness. People who are happy work better, period. 
No more discussion. People who are unhappy works with less productivity. No more discussion. Slaves were always unhappy because they have lost control of their life and of their liberty. That's one of the worst possible conditions of human indignity. So let me move on because I think I have left about five minutes. Um, global citizenship education. You can read one of my books about it, but basically it started with an idea. Into th it's a very old idea in the, in the Western philosophy. It started with the Greeks and so on. But it was resuscitated and implemented in 2012 the, the, with Ban Ki-moon, the Secretary General of the UN, for the first time in the history of the UN, decided to do an initiative based on education called Global Education First Initiative, Jeffy. And he said three things are needed. The first one, access. Access to education. The second one, quality of education. Because I pose it to you, I am not in agreement with those who think doesn't matter the quality of education we have in the schools. The kids have to be in the schools. We inoculate kids against the school and learning if the quality of education is poor. It's true. It's better to have the kids in the school than in the streets. But that's not education. That is essentially a parking lot full of kids rather than full of cars. And third, Ban Ki-moon said, all of this is possible with a linchpin Global citizenship. And went back to the Greeks and defined global citizenship in the same way that the Greeks define, which is we are all part of the same humanity. We are all part of the same humanity. So that is the very basic principle of global citizenship education. I don't have a lot of time to continue with this argument. But let me tell you that you need things. You need civil minimums. You cannot have citizenship unless you have access to education, affordable education, affordable quality education, to jobs or work, affordable housing, affordable transportation, maybe insurance if you lose your job. Most of the element constructed under the concept of the welfare state, which is the liberal solution to the crisis of capitalism, and it started with a new um, deal around the 1930s in the US, but it was already experimented in Northern Europe 100 years before. So then you have to have three different types of philosophies or values underscoring education. You need civic knowledge, civic skills, and civic virtues. I believe that this combination of civic knowledge, what you need to know to practice, learn about, and criticize the problems of democracy is civil knowledge. Civic skills, you need to know how to effectively intervene in the construction of democracy. And of course, civic virtues. There are several virtues that you need to understand in order to practice them in the daily life. If I said before that everybody wants to be happy, there is a basic liberal principle that is mostly in all the laws existing on the planet, with few exceptions, and it's the following. Individual interest have to be curtailed to some extent, so collective interest or the common good is not curtailed. And that concept is central for the construction of civic virtues. Maybe we have time for two more slides. The first one is this one, the domains. Global citizenship education is based on three principles. One is the cognitive principle to acquire knowledge, understanding, and critical thinking about global, regional, national, and local issues and the intersections and interdependence of different countries and populations. 
The second one is the socio-emotional part. <clears throat> the socio-emotional part has to do with the sense of belonging. And the third one is the behavioral one, which is how you produce in your own life the conditions for a peaceful and sustainable world. I must say this. We are in the context of redefining through the work of UNESCO a great deal of the curriculum, particularly in elementary and secondary school through the implementation of global citizenship. And I have one important criticism that I'm not so sure how can be dealt with. When you look at the cognitive part, you can have metrics. You can measure how much a kid knows about a particular topic. That's what we do all the time in our classrooms. But how do you have metrics about the socio-emotional and behavioral levels? They're outside the classroom. You cannot follow them. You can follow ex post factum, right? This kid that bought pieces of a gun because he was completely frustrated because the death of his father and was smart enough to put together a gun. It's called ghost, ghost guns. They don't, they're not sold. They sell you bits and pieces in the US. You can build your own gun, untraceable. And when one morning to the school, and shoot as many people as he could, kill three, insure a few more, and then blow up his head. He wanted to die. So then, when you look at the socio-emotional and behavioral, you begin to argue, and the arguments, he was not ready for this, he was not ready for that, nobody look at what happened to him. But it's a post-factum argument. You cannot use metrics in post-factum. Because the only thing that you can say, and I'm afraid I will give you a statistic that you don't want to hear, is that more than 30% of the global population is moving into different forms of alienation. 20 years from now, that statistic will be much higher. Okay, so let me move faster. I think I have another minute or two. Let me move faster to, well, these are global competences. You can read um, an interesting document just created by the Brookings Institution. This is another way to look at global citizenship education. But look at the first one, empathy. Without empathy, you don't have citizenship. Without empathy, you don't have essentially global citizenship. When I thought about this particular lecture, because I'm a comparativist and I try to be very respectful, look at me. I'm talking to you and I don't understand Arabic. I'm not saying Egyptian Arabic, period, Arabic. And I don't understand local vernaculars. I'm not a student of Egypt. So what I'm doing here? I thought, what can I say of something that I really do know that could be helpful in Egypt to promote global citizenship? And I have essentially, first, the idea of revisiting Ferreri. Um, I just published a book over 600 pages, the Wiley Blackwell Handbook of Paulo Freire that is revisiting Freire for our contemporary world. Freire doesn't have all the answers. Maybe he has only limited answers, but very powerful answers. I recommend Freire as a way to rethink some aspects of education in Egypt. Secondly, I recommend to look at some of the experiences in Latin America. And there are two in particular that I think are very, very relevant. The first one is the question of popular education. And in the Pablo Freire Institute that I helped to create it with Pablo Freire when he was alive, we talk about popular public education. And the two terms, the popular and the public, are very important. The public, because it speaks about the notion of the public sphere, of the public as a way to consolidate a political aspiration of equality and equity, but also the notion of the public as something that is provided by the state and therefore is affordable to all individuals, public. There are ways in which you have private systems 
that provide education, but they have provided education with the same model that is supposed to exist nationwide. And the second element is popular, because I speak of the people. And you have to incorporate the desires, the wishes, the utopias, the knowledge of the people. And that model has existed in Latin America for the last 50 years, maybe 60 years, and is worth to experience. And finally, in order to open the conversation, I would like to suggest a particular methodology also invented in Latin America, but it has become very popular worldwide. Participatory action research, which is a model of intervention and a scholarship that create conditions for the poor, the underrepresented, the people that don't have anybody advocating for them to get closer to the process of social transformation as articulated in global citizenship and as articulated in these other two constructs that I mentioned some time ago, particularly social justice education. I thank you very much for your patience. Thank you very much, Professor Torres. This was an extremely insightful 40 minutes. Um, if the audience will allow me, I will first start with a few qu queries that I had, um, and then we'll open the floor for questions. And uh, the way we will do this is that we will take um, several questions at once, have an answer, and then continue. Um, so I'd like to for us to maybe revisit um, one of the things that you said that, that sort of stayed with me, which is this idea that uh, people are not nat necessarily naturally born to be um, democratic. Um, and so the, the idea is if, this, if we accept this as a premise, uh, that then we only have two options, um, either that they are educated in formal settings or perhaps in informal ones. Can you elaborate a little bit further on this point? Because um, I feel like it might be a somewhat controversial thing to say. And also, how do you um, answer those who, for example, would raise uh, India as a model where you have a democracy and maybe not everybody is literate, etc.? When I said this, I follow two principles. One is the, the, the basic principle of critical theory, which I am part of. The logic of suspicion. In critical theory, we suspect that inside any cultural inter uh, interaction, there is a moment of domination. So if that is true, one of the basic elements in the construction of democracy is to confront individuals, even their worst, <coughs> their worst uh, spiritual feelings, like the idea of bullying, with this idea that domination is one element that precludes us to achieve conflict resolution, to achieve shared cultures, to achieve crossing the lines of difference, to achieve essentially a community. And like it or not, we all live in communities. A family is a community, extended family is a larger community. And remember, the community needs communion. I'm a Catholic, but the communion is breaking bread. And you break bread in your families every day. Do you break bread in love or in crisis? Do you break bread in dialogue or in polemics? So <clears throat> the whole argument about learning it's a process of figuring out this critical moment through systematic appraisals of the need to reconstruct the question of nature through nurturing. The nature and nurture is a tension that will never go away. And the second element, the second principle is what I will call the notion of how can I put it in very simple ways? Curiosity. I remember a very brilliant 
historian from UCLA, now working in another university, that I said to him, so and so, I have a very curious, brilliant uh, son, and he may want to study history. Do you think that this would be a good place? He looked at me and said, of course not. You, you bring it here, we'll destroy him. We'll destroy everything he has. All the knowledge he has, all the spirituality he has, anything that he brings good, we will make it bad. Don't bring him here. I thought it was a very honest advice from a father to another father. So essentially, this element of curiosity needs to be preserved. And what is fascinating to me is that when the children are growing up, they are also being transformed. They are transformed in their brains, so there is an element connected with the nanotechnology of our brains, and they are also transformed in their behavior. And this question of evolution of the human being and the holistic value-oriented evolution have to go together. And therefore, I will insist that it's very difficult for people who have not been exposed systematically to democratic practices to become democratic. Let me finish with one concrete example. I spent my sabbatical in Germany, Eastern Germany. I wanted to go to Eastern Germany. So I was invited and I gave some lectures in Jena University, Frederick Schiller University at Jena, which is in Eastern Germany. The last election in that particular province, the ruling parties of Germany, which are kind of established ruling parties, didn't get more than 15, 16% of the vote. All the authoritarian parties in Germany, including the new Nazi parties, got the majority of the vote. Why? Make your, uh, your calculation. These are the third generation, not the, the first, the third generation emerging after the Berlin Wall was fell down. But it's a generation that we lo logically, from the East, Germany has serious objection to the way they were treated when they were incorporated into Germany. And it cost West Germany a tons, tons of money. And they have all sorts of objections about their own future. The image of the future needs to be considered in the context of hope. If the image of the future has no hope, then you take very drastic actions in synthesis. I am not surprised that because the lack of democratic spirit that existed in East Germany, given an authoritarian regime, that has been trying to be modified over the last 30 years, we celebrated recently 30 years of the fall of the Berlin Wall, has not been sufficient. And that's the reason that authoritarian parties are gaining more and more of the youth in East, Eastern Germany. Um, again, if the audience will allow me, I'll just ask one more question. Um, my question pertains to the notion of global citizenship education. Um, how would you respond to people who say that global citizenship education as a concept is actually replacing uh, transformative social justice because there's an emphasis now on this idea of coexistence, civic education, etc., cetera, um, with sometimes seeming a de-emphasis on um, class struggle, uh, social justice, etc. So how would you sort of um, attempt to bridge these two things together and make them part of one educational program uh, rather than see them as two different um, entities that do not um, speak to each other? It is a synthesis and includes anything that you want to include in that synthesis. For instance, I cannot imagine global citizenship education without the concept of sustainability or the concept of peace. And if you really look at global citizenship education, sustainability and peace, you have three different constituencies. These constituencies, some of them have fought for years in the idea of denuclearizing to prevent uh, an atomic uh, disaster, the idea of peace, etc., is a constituency. Now it could be incorporated under the ages of global citizenship education. It's a synthesis. See my three different uh, circles. However, I thought that you would also ask me, which is important to consider, 
what are the pushbacks against this concept? And there are two types. One pushback, which I will consider sympathetic pushback, is the idea that some people have, and a very valuable point, why we talk about this new concept when we already have concepts like this, let's say Ubuntu in Africa. Ubuntu meaning I am because we are. Ubuntu meaning we are part of a community. Why are you bringing this foreign concept? It's a safe critique, and it's a good critique, and requires an epistemological accommodation that we don't have the time to discuss here. And then, of course, you have another pushback from authoritarian governments, from re uh, religious extremism, from extremism that cut across all religions, because I am very much aware of the Islamophobia that exists in the US and in other places. Islam is one of the most fascinating religions in the world, one of the most peaceful religions in the world, one of the most egalitarian religions in the world. But the Islamophobia is always predicated on certain people that are singled out as responsible for a particular act. So there is a lot of extremism in some of these white evangelicals that I mentioned because they are ignoring all these failings of this individual who has said terrible things about women, who has terrible things about people with disabilities, who is really a, an individual without any ethical principles, and they give him a pass because God has sent us him to protect us. You know why? It's the question of the minorities. When you know that you will be a minority in a particular social formation, you create any kind of argument, be this a theocratic argument, that God has sent Trump to be protecting this group, which is growing more and more as a minority. Solid voting bloc, but less and less so in every election. So you have all these extremes, and of course, Anything connected with neopopulism, fascism, etc., is another example of this pushback against a concept that essentially means this. We, are all, we all have the same DNA. We are part of a collective humanity. I know that people will be very unhappy with what I'm saying. And know that every time I speak about liberalism, if I, have, if I make the same argument that I made here in Latin America, it will be a tremendous pushback from several sectors of the audience. Yes, the social context of the conversation matters and matters a great deal. But I'm still willing and able to define this concept as a progress in our quest for a much happier life in our globes and civilizations. Thank you very much. We will now open the floor for questions. Um, yes. The first question you said is that we are against the children who do not have the education in the education. This sentence is very difficult for us in Egypt. لان احنا لو قلنا للاباء والامهات ما تودوش ولادكم الا في مدارس فيها مستوى جيد من جوده التعليم ده معناه ان كل اطفال المصريين او الغالبيه العظمى منهم مش هيتعلموا. ف ففي ظل حاله فقر شديد جدا في مؤسسات التعليم المصريه سواء في التعليم قبل الجامعي او حتى في التعليم الجامعي ازاي انا آه أطالب بأنه لازم يكون جودة التعليم هو الشرط طبعا هو الأمنية اللي نتمناها أنها تتحقق بس في حالة الفقر الشديد في مؤسساتنا البديل الحاجة الثانية اللي أنا عايزة حضرتك توضحها لي هي حضرتك كلمت عن التعليم الاجتماعي التحويلي أنا مهتمة أن حضرتك تديني أكتر معلومات وتفاصيل عن إزاي أحقق حالة التعليم التحويلي الاجتماعي شكرا أنا بحيي حضرتك على المحاضرة وأعتقد إن أنا لما أجي أسمع التعليم من أجل العدالة الاجتماعية هسمع وقت أطول على زي تعليم المهمشين والفقراء وحضرتك كده عديت عليها سريعا جدا أنا عايزة بس أتكلم كمان على العدالة الاجتماعية طبعا لازم نتكلم على أبو التربويين لازم نتكلم على باورو فريري أنا عايزة أقول لك إن إحنا بنشتغل في مؤسسة مؤسسة صغيرة جدا لكن احنا متبعين منهج باولو فريري. احنا بناخد الطريقة الصوتية 
مش بس الطريقه الصوتيه لا احنا كمان عندنا شكل من اشكال المواطنه العالميه بنستخدمها مع الولاد واحنا بنعلمهم احنا بنت... بنركز على المعرفه بنركز كمان على ان الولاد يعبروا يعبروا عن نفسهم ان هم ي... ليهم حق التعبير ان هم ليهم حق الاعتراض ان احنا بنخلق جو جوه المؤسسه هو جو يعني في نوع عالي جدا من المواطنه احنا بنقبل الاختلافات مسيحيين مسلمين ابيض اسود فاحنا نموذج صغير جدا موجود في بلد مش في بلد في منطقه جوه القاهره منطقه منبوذه منطقه عشوائيه منطقه ما حدش يعرف عنها حاجه لكن احنا شغالين شغالين في ارض الواقع يعني فعلا ايدينا لمسه الواقع ازاي ممكن نعلم الفقراء بطريقه ابو التربويين باولو فريرو شكرا So uh, I, I do like the idea that you mentioned about the uh, schooling versus educating. Uh, so uh, maybe we are sending p uh, kids to school, but they are not well educated. But uh, most of my studies in uh, the area called learner experience. So um, I, I would like to have some references, recommendations about how to let kids experience democracy and citizenship inside the uh, schools, culture or the classroom, and experiencing this not only as a curriculum or knowledge. I want them to experience the idea, to practice and experience the idea of democracy and citizenship. The second question and the most important for us that uh, most of the time we are talking to educators, teachers, to apply this in the schools and the classrooms. But the educators themselves, the teachers themselves, they didn't experience this as kids, as students first, or as citizens as well. So how to, how to help in this? We're asking uh, educators to do something in the classroom and in, in the uh, school, and they didn't experience this before. So it may be in just knowledge transfer, but we want to have an experience transfer, not just knowledge transfer. Thank you. Thank you very much. The three questions have uh, a sense of unity for me. The first question was an objection to my parking lot model, uh, but uh, I will explain in a second. Uh, and, and the other element of the first intervention was how we define and make sure this question of participatory transformational education. That's the first question. The second question is how we educate the poor or the underrepresented and the experience from uh, a small uh, group of people working with Paulo Freire in a, in a marginal area is quite relevant for me. And you use a particular question of how you can put together a focus on knowledge and self-expression. And the third question, third intervention with two questions. One is uh, how you can explain the foundations of the connection between democracy and citizenship and the focus on teachers, assuming that the teachers may not have the resources or the values to undertake such a particular uh, project. The first element that I see in all the three questions is like can synthesize with dialogue. Dialogue is both a method of teaching and learning as much as it is a methodology for research. And in the first intervention, you cannot have really an active, transformative, participatory education without a very robust sense of dialogue across the different hierarchies of the institution across the different groups in the institution and according how this dialogue facilitate communication. Dialogue was central in Freire model and um, I will recommend a beautiful book by Nick Bourbules on dialogue. And Bourbules is one of the main philosophers of education in the US and I tell you, um, I think that book in itself will facilitate the conversation. Now, before I move on with dialogue, I would like to answer the, 
the part of the, what I saw was a kind of pushback to my critique that schools are parking lots. Look, in locus parenti, in locus parenti, that statement means we educate the children of the other instead of the parents. For the parents, it is a disaster if they have to take a shower in the morning and the kids don't go to school. What do you do with the kids? Schools are a front line of defense in locus parenti because the parents may not have the time or the opportunity or the knowledge to actually educate their own children. I come from California. I tell you this. One of my sons, the one that I mentioned that was so creative, is a teacher in uh, fifth grade now. He teaches in two languages. Every single thing he said has to say it in Spanish and in English. Fifth grade. These kids have been immersed in English throughout their whole lives as immigrants. But in the families, these kids are the communication with the outside world because these kids speak Spanish at home. The neighborhood speaks Spanish. So in order to conduct the training, my son has to teach in two languages at the same time. If you ever try that to teach in Arabic and English at the same time, imagine how you come up with a curriculum that will be matching a curriculum in which everybody is teaching in English or everybody is teaching in Arabic. There's no, it's a race that you cannot ever match. So there is one element, in my opinion, what in locus parenti, that you work on behalf of the parents, but you work with the children of other. What a responsibility. And who is above you regulating the actions? The state. Because the laws are the one that will articulate the behavior that you have to promote, the behavior that you have to do, the behavior that you must have in order to love, because teaching is paideia, and paideia, another Greek term, the previous one was Latin, paideia is love of knowledge. If you have the love for knowledge, how do you instill the love of knowledge to your students. The first argument is respect. Dialogue always exists with respect. So let me finish with this critique of the parking lot. I said one thing that will be contradictory for what I said. I said, I don't want the kids to be in a parking lot. I want the kids to be actively engaged in learning. But we need parking lots. You have driven your cars to get here. You need to put your car somewhere. The metaphor is terrible. But in a way, you need your children at a certain time to be in a certain place. Be that place then, a liberatory place is better than being a boring place that inoculates the children against learning. And finally, I will say, particularly for the poor uh, groups of our societies, the schools are the first line of defense, even in nutrition. I was very poor. I come from the working class. I had my breakfast in the school. My mother sometimes didn't have enough for me to have milk. So my breakfast was in the school. Today, in Argentina, that I know very well, kids who are completely destitute go to a school not because they have interest in the school, some of them might, but because they eat breakfast and lunch. If that is not an element of the welfare state, I don't know what that is welfare state. So my critique is that understanding all the limitations, the school should be a place in which we construct the enchantment of life. If we don't construct the enchantment of life for the teachers and for the students, we have failed. Now, in terms of dialogue, 
That is one element to construct this enchantment of, 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 of life. And there are two aspects that I would like to emphasize following the tradition of Freire. Number one, knowledges are multiple knowledges. Have you ever thought about the tension between knowledge and wisdom? It seems that when you get old, you have more wisdom. The joke is sometimes when you get old, you have forgotten all your knowledge, so you have wisdom. It is true that wisdom and knowledge are two different things. But it's true that knowledge is not one, it's multiple knowledge. Because the people that come to your classrooms have multiple original ways to look at reality. And those original ways to look at reality have to be fully accepted and fully represented in the dialogue. But to do that, you need to do something else. And this is a very difficult thing going back to teachers now. I have a question now for several of my friends. I have friends all over the world, as you can imagine. So I take advantage, I abuse their patients. They love me, I love them, but I abuse their patients. My next question that has been circulated with my friends is this. Can the teachers understand and explain the big picture? Which is a summatory of knowledge. Can the teacher understand and explain the big picture? Of course, if you want to criticize me, you said, what is the big picture? What are you talking about? So then if I answer that, we spend another two hours or three hours and will be the dire hearts and you, you have no leave, you have to be here with me. So anyway, but everybody else will leave. But the point is, there is a big picture. And that big picture regulates through the political economy, through politics, through values, your life, my life, the life of the children you're educating. So the teacher needs to figure out what the big picture is and need to be very well trained to essentially work in dialogue with the different knowledges. But there is something else, multiple cultures, multiple cultures. Look, Egypt is a fascinating example of the multiple cultures in the bottom of a society, one of the oldest societies, one of the oldest civilizations in the world. What is wrong with multiple cultures? Nothing. It's perfect. If we learn from each other, it's perfect. If dialogue really cut across authenticity, it's perfect. If people dialogue, even if they are upset, it is perfect. Diversity is the DNA of humanity. It should be in our classroom and should be respected. And finally, the question of, of democracy. If you don't have democratic classrooms, you don't have democratic societies. And it's not only the responsibility of the teacher. I don't want to bang the heads of the teachers. Look, there are teachers that don't have enough money. They are not even fully respected in their own society. I know this because I work extensively in China, in Japan, in Korea. The status of the teacher is incredible. Some Muslim traditions give to the teacher a fantastic status. I know that because I have several Muslim students and I'm their teacher, so imagine how they treat me. But it's not very common. In the US, a teacher makes less money than a policeman. It's like we reward fear and we don't reward love. So the point I'm trying to make is that in order to really figure out how you have democracy, you need to work at several levels. Precondition, democratic schooling. How to build democratic schooling is a debate that should exist inside the society that is trying to achieve that. And secondly, you need democratic public policy. Both of them are very difficult to obtain. Are there dreams? Yes. Are there possible dreams? Yes. I am Dr. Mohammed Anis, an economist. From my perspective, and I don't know, uh, uh, will you agree with me or not? Uh, if I want to put a master title to your presentation, it will be education for reaching global citizenship. So, 
I don't know if you visited Japan before or not, but let me say that the pre-education there is very developed, very depending upon creativity, and teaching kids how to be creative, but in the same time, it's so closed, very patriotic, and very depending upon inherited national, national values. Let's say it is so far of the global citizenship and the Western values, so far from, so far f uh, f from being cosmopolitan. So what's your comment about that? Uh, <clears throat> I have a question regarding the idea of uh, global citizen, citizenship education. Um, like, don't you think that this idea overlooks the global inequalities in a way? And I mean, I can understand that this kind of uh, like methodology of education can work really well and be embedded in, uh, let's say, a country like the United States of America or like generally like developed countries in the EU or like Japan. Countries that has kind of educational structure that can support this, and also in on another hand, like countries that uh, its citizens can, in a way, uh, see this idea of a global citizen given um, like access to resources or like access to mobility as a as a person. Like you know, like I I personally as a per, you know, as a as a human, I uh, I can't really relate to the idea of global citizenship as. Uh, as a as a person, because we can't really, I can't really personally see it in, you know, like we are not equal at the end of the day. Like there is a huge gap of like global inequality, not only on resources or like economic resources, but even in like knowledge or mobility. You know, like if we don't have this kind of uh, equality of global mobility, how can we uh, um, have any sort of uh, global citizen citizenship education? And also, how how does idea of global citizenship education when it comes to sustainability or economic or the like environment looks into also like the like we're not also equal when it comes to let's say like c co2 c uh, uh like carbon like said uh, emissions and how this affects the the or, uh, how this affects the environment and how um you know like big industrial countries are the ones that produce the most of these, um, the most of these, uh, like gases, and so generally, like the relationship between like uh, global citizenship education and how it works, when it doesn't really uh, critically looks at uh, the state of like global inequality in the world. Um, hello, Dr. Torres. Uh, uh, so I have a question uh, with the spread of uh, monitoring cameras uh, in classrooms, and this is maybe in a growing trend, it's in some countries, and maybe it will spread to other countries, where there is that facial recognition, sound recognition, the students and the teachers are totally monitored in classrooms, and maybe this will um, expand worldwide. How can democratic practices happen in the classroom, uh, global citizenship, and all of this happen if uh, with this digital objectif objectification of students and teachers? Thank you. I will try to be more concise than before because I have already added several arguments and I will continue to build on those arguments. With respect to, to the question of national identity and, uh, and, and citizenship, I think there are two elements that I have emphasized in my own writing. Number one, like it or not, the concept of global citizenship education is an intervention. It's an intervention in search for a theory. Since I don't believe there is a theory, and I'm beginning to worry whether we need a theory, I have worked in creating a meta-theory with a theory about theory. But the first element is intervention. Now, how do you intervene respecting the national identity and the national citizenship? And the answer is very simple. You have to add value to national citizenship. In other terms, global citizenship education is acknowledging a reality in the world. The first element of that reality in the world is that more and more the borders have been erased. The, the, the nation state is still quite powerful, but 
not powerful enough to ignore these elements of intersectionality. That's the reason that uh, we have in the, in the Hague a, a, a court that study genocide and essentially brings people from other parts of the world and judge them according to genocide. Why? Because genocide is being penalized worldwide by being the most atrocious element against human rights. So, in other terms, the intersectionality I'm talking about is that the local laws can be very specific, but they cannot, in the end, contradict the global elements incorporated in human rights. And that is one of the most controversial things that I said in the whole afternoon, because many countries sign off on human rights and do not apply it. And that concept then is defended in terms that our democracy is different democracy. Our understanding of human rights is a different understanding of human rights. And nobody has the right to tell us what to do. To some extent, that ends with limits. The limit of genocide is the ending of that. At that moment, the UN put together an army, intervened, eliminates the condition for the genocide, and leaves. Therefore, the power of the nation state is continuously in check in limit situations by the power of the international system. And that's the reason I say, if these are the limits, let's look at the possibilities. And the possibilities is using a concept like this one to enhance the quality of citizenship, which is not only national, because they are regional citizenships. They are community citizenships, et cetera, et cetera. The second question was about the question of global inequality, right? Don't ever dream that global citizenship education will eliminate global inequality. That's an element of public policy. But look, when you begin to look at questions like global commons, you install the conversation on global commons on the social networks. When you begin to, to, to look at questions of how we can live together in peace. So when you begin to add all the elements that I spoke about today, you have a different set of values that call, that cry, that urge all of us to fight for a more global, equal world. Or do you think that is just by chance that in the US, a group of billionaires are saying, the state should tax me more. Some people said, yes, they should tax me more, and I should give more money to, to uh, uh, philanthropy. Are they getting crazy? Somebody put something in their drinks? No. It's the recognition. And I go back to the Greeks now. It's the recognition that growing inequality creates global problems. Plato, in one of his dialogues, said in a society in which people are very separated by wealth, we have conspiracies from the other part of the society. It's a question of security. If you want to keep your wealth, you have to have some security, meaning by that, you have to create some system which is global. But I also recognize that global citizenship education means different things to different people. There are people who are international leaders of particular areas that travel all over the world, that essentially live out of making deals. These are the kind of global citizens that they enjoy that kind of understanding of global citizenship. Let me do my thing with no checks and balances. And finally, I will say the question of mobility. The question of mobility is connected with learning. Why am I speaking in English when I have to exile from Argentina? If not a dictator, she would have killed me. And I did not know any English. I learned English when I started my PhD at Stanford University. It's not that I was a stupid and I didn't know that I have to learn English. It's simply I didn't have the possibility before. So I put myself 
in the worst possible condition. I don't know if you have ever been uh, trained how to swim. There is one school of swim that gets a baby and throw the baby in the water and see what happens. If the baby sinks, they, res they usually rescue the baby. But some babies don't sink. Like some dogs, they don't sink. They just swim. So I went to swim. There were no sharks. I was happy to learn English in three months. English is a factor of mobility. Is the language of global trade for the moment. For the moment. The second language in the internet is, and you probably have already guessed that, Chinese. If I have children who are young, what I will do is not to have them learning English and French, because French is highly educated society, and I appreciate the French culture very much. English and Chinese. And then see what happens with the life. That is mobility. So global citizenship education should help mobility. One more element, and I move to the last question. Is it possible to have it all? No. No. One seven of the world lives with less than two dollars a day. How would you go to these people that barely survive and tell them, you must be a global citizen? The guy look at you and say, what are you talking about? Give me two dollars. Because the truth is that there are extreme situations that require extreme solutions. Global citizenship education is not an extreme solution to drastic poverty. Could be a contributor, but not an extreme solution. And the other question is the per proverbial question of how you construct democratic classrooms in different environments. I must say, one has to be very careful. I'm a comparativist, and as a comparativist, I understand that to compare is to understand. Think of yourself when you go to the supermarket. Imagine that the doctor says to you, you have a problem with sugar. People at a certain age have a problem with sugar. All right, what do you do when you go to the supermarket? You want to buy granola, you compare and buy the granola with the one that has the less sugar, right? You learn comparing. The same with democratic schools. You have to see experiences, how it is done, compare, and see what you can adapt. In the model of comparison that I endorse, is called borrowing and lending. You borrow and you lend. There were experiences on Friday here, right? There are multiple experiences of, on Friday's work all over the world. Freire did not have a recipe. He had a set of techniques and a political philosophy based on values. If you endorse some of the techniques, if you endorse some of the values, you can apply Freire everywhere in the world as long as you filter it through the conditions of the culture, the conditions of the community, the conditions of the civilization. So there is no silver bullet, as they call it in the US. Global citizenship education is not a one-size-fits-all answer to the dilemmas of the global world. Uh, are there any more questions? All right. We only have time, I think, for two. One, two. Two. We have, OK, this is very difficult. You're putting me in an awkward situation. OK. Um, and I thought, um, and I thought, who been telling me that the Ashhat is too much to have to do. We are here when we talk about the other things. We are not going to be able to do the most important things from the Ashhat or the Aqaa or the needs of the Ashhat. So we are talking about the idea of the social education, which is the training of the adult. لازم نفهم ان فكره التعليم العادل بتشمل ان احنا نبقى عادلين مع كل فئات المجتمع بما فيهم الاشخاص ذوي الاعاقه او بما فيهم الاشخاص التم وضعاف التم بمعنى لو انا هدخلهم في مدرسه نظاميه عامه وادمجهم مع ناس بتتكلم فكده مش معناها ان انا هرميهم جوه المدرسه دي 
لا ده كمان انا اوفر لهم الترجمه الاشاريه والوتيره الكتابيه عشان اوصل للمساواه الفكر ده مش موجود عندنا في الدوله للاسف اول ما بنتكلم على فكره المدرسه والمساواه في المدرسه بنفهم ان احنا حطوهم جوه الفصل مثلا زينة او مظهر بس لكن مش بنفكر ان احنا نوصل لفكره العدالة الاجتماعية في التعليم وان احنا نفرق بين الدمج ان احنا نحطهم وسط المجتمع وان احنا نوصل بيهم للعدل ان احنا مثلا نوفر لهم الوسيلة المناسبة عشان يوصلوا للعدل ده فالفكرة دي مش موجودة هنا ازاي اقدر افعلها خصوصا في ظل قوانين بتاعتنا يعني مثلا احنا كاشخاص توم مش مسموح لنا كلنا نخش المدرسة مع التمانين ده بيعتمد على نسبة السمع بتاع كل واحد وده منطق غير عادل بالمرة بنتبنى لأن لو أنا هدخل شخص ما بيسمعش فإيه المشكلة إن أنا أوفرله مثلا ترجمة إشارية وأدمجه جوه المجتمع وده للأسف بيخلي مجموعة من السم تطلع فئة منعزلة عن المجتمع وبتبتدي إن هي تنعزل فما بنقدرش نحقق الدمج ده إن معظم المجتمع هنا ممكن اقول ان نتبع منهم بيتلقى تعليم عادل وكويس اكتر مننا في حين ان مجموعه من الاشخاص الثوم عندنا نسبه كبيره جدا بتعاني من الامه او ان هي مش بتعرف تقرا وتكتب نتيجه ان احنا ما بنبصش لثقافتهم ما بنرجعش للثوم دولت نفهم السيركولوجيا بتاعت الاثام الثقافه بتاعتهم طريقه تعامل منهم ازاي مع المجتمع كل ده ما بناخدوش في دراسه فإيه مقترحات حضرتك عشان نقدر نطور الأوضاع دي؟ شكرا. أهلا دكتور كارلوس في مصر، علي حسن جيولوجي وكاتب. هو هو أكتر من سؤال هو زيادة تفسير. بالنسبة للمواطنة العالمية أو عالمية المواطنة كانت تاريخيا كانت موجودة بوضوح أكتر في يعني لو بصينا للحضارة البنقية والرومانية هي بترتبط ارتباط وسيط بالسياسه فكانت عالميا كانت الاكثر مواطنه والشعوب كانت اكثر مواطنه بعد كده في كسياسيا كل دوله بقت تحافظ على سياستها وعلى ثقافتها وبقى اكثر العالم فيها اكثر تقاقع على النفس لو احنا فتحنا المجال للمواطنه العالميه هيكون في ذراع واحد بيأثر على العالم كله كامريكا كثقافه وتاثير ثقافي على العالم كله فده هيختفي مع ثقافات كتيرة موجودة في العالم وبتختفي معاها كل العادات وكل الصفات اللي بتكرسها نتيجة لقوة واحدة ووحيدة في العالم هي هي أمريكا وفي نفس الوقت أعتقد إن إن تطبيق الفكرة ديت كدول انهارت زي العراق أو سوريا هتصبح صعب جدا وفي نفس الوقت في أوروبا المواطنة عالميا واضحه في رفض المهاجرين السوريين في بعض الدول الاوروبيه ده صعب جدا ان هو يخلي المواطنه العالميه حقيقه اكتر ما تكون من هي حلم صعب المنال كنا في الاول او في الماضي او بدايه العالم كانت موجود موجوده وحقيقه اعتقد دلوقتي صعبه جدا شكرا thank you very much for both questions um, I must tell you that I have very little knowledge about uh, special needs individuals, though I realize that if somebody will speak about global citizenship education, that should apply to them as well. And my only possible reflection is that you cannot have global citizenship education without a social compact. The social compact What we are facing now is that a lot of the elements of the previous social compact is in complete breakdown. So you may argue, and I think you may be right, that saying that some of these needs of the special needs people are not fully represented in a great deal of the public policies that we see today. I agree. But if global citizenship education will have that particular power, to improve the life of people have to include these conditions and how to help these kind of people who may be considered also oppressed by very different traditions. So my only suggestion at this point is to argue 
the people that are interested in those particular populations, subpopulations, they should really think about the possible answers to the same question that you pose. In fact, one of my uh, master's students of last year focused exactly on that question. And he said, I have decided to work on global citizenship education for people with um, blind people, different kind of special needs. So I think it's an, not going to say it's a specialty, it's something that needs to be done. I don't have a particular answer. Now, the nagging question on hegemony, uh, let me put it in this way. You cannot have global citizenship education without human rights. But to have human rights, you have to decouple human rights from imperialism. And that is my first part of the answer. If you really look at genocides, every time you have a big genocide, is usually connected with the lack of interest of the most powerful countries on earth to intervene because they don't have interest in that area. Rwanda being a fascinating and at the same time tragic experience. The blue helmets from the UN were there and they were invited to retreat. A very brave general from uh, Canada with a group of uh, soldiers from a nation, I don't remember, stay and intervene trying to ameliorate what was essentially a massacre of one ethnic group against another ethnic group. Overall, then the leaders were sanctioned in the Hague and so on. But in less than six months, about 800,000 people were killed. Why? Almost a million. Why? because none intervened. Almost similar was the Balkans, almost similar, because Clinton hesitated. He was being uh, under his impeach, this and that. Clinton was the only interested in intervening in the Balkans. The rest of the surrounded country were waiting for the leadership of the US. When finally the US gave the green light, the Balkan intervention happened, but it was already a bit late. Neighbors killing their own neighbors? People that have lived together for generations, killing the person next door? And sometimes I understand some people want to kill your neighbor. The neighbor's dog is barking all night. You cannot have a sleep. You want to go and kill the dog and then the neighbor. But usually you don't do that. In a civilized society, you talk about the dog with the neighbor. But these guys were killing their own neighbor because there was a simple different ethnicity. Why? Because we are facing that situation more, more often than we expect. So the question of hegemony, in my opinion, need to be constructed decoupling, decoupling separating human rights from empire, empire. The other element is the question of regime change. Dominant societies tend to think that they can intervene military and produce a regime change. Look at Iran. They are still mulling over the idea of going into Iran, make them pay for what they did to the American group or in the embassy, and regime change. You see all this movie about Iran, the word that appears everywhere is regime change. Look. Regime change will be out of the question, not only in Iran, everywhere else. Because every time somebody wants to create a regime change, create a complete change in the social formation and rarely the actual change of regime, with the exception that the new regime has the same practices with a different name. So the idea of hegemony is the ability to produce regime change. One of the elements of today's situation, which I didn't want to really uh, elaborate in detail, is that there is a crisis of hegemony of the ruling countries in the world. That is good and bad. It's good because it will allow for people to confront debates with a little bit more freedom. It's bad because some other countries may be emerging either as um, regional powers, 
or as alternative powers to liberal democracy. The best example in this context is uh, Russia. Russia is not a global power. And look, you have it next door now. At least China is a global power. And China is overplaying their hand. They have created this fictitious island, expanded the control of some part of the ocean, etc. They are going into a serious confrontation with the neighbors. All of those things talks about hegemony. So I'm very concerned about this idea that people can speak about human rights one way or another and still try to exercise a model of hegemony. My perception, this may sound too optimistic, but I think that we are almost at the end of a very difficult period. I see a renaissance in the next decade or so. And this renaissance should be a project combined with a redefinition of the role of the different states in the global system and a stronger position of the UN to articulate conflict resolution worldwide, not only inside the, uh, the, uh, the way in which it's been done with the uh, Security Council. The UN is the Security Council. We need a UN that is beyond the Security Council. And I think in this renaissance that I can imagine is going to happen in the next 20 or 10 to 20 years. If the UN doesn't get straightened, I don't see much future for global citizenship, and I don't, see, I don't see much future for the whole life world on this planet. So either the UN is straightened and becomes like a super state, or we will have a very tragic ending of our civilizations. I'm not trying to be the prophet of dumb, but I am pretty sure that at some point cool heads will figure out that with the diminishing power of the US in the 21st century, the rising power of micro powers like Russia or the ma macro power like China, somebody have to figure out who is the arbiter of this soccer game. And the only arbiter left in town is the UN, not only the interconnections between the different countries, but the UN. That's the reason that the future UN secretaries have to be very proactive in negotiating throughout. Let's see, they need the resources and political will. At the moment, the UN has very little political will and even less resources. Thank you very much, Professor Torres. This has been an extremely interesting uh, few hours. We thank our audience very much for your very engaging questions, um, and we hope to see you soon. Thank you very much, and we'll give a final round of applause to our guests.